Why don't someone lift up the name of the Lord? Come on, somebody. Does someone believe in this house? God used so many times little children to example, just to be an example, to exemplify that belief, that faith, that purity, that innocence, just that simple belief. I wonder if right now, if we could just take a moment and why don't we just lift up our hands? The Lord is here. The Lord wants to minister to each and every one of us. Come on, somebody want, the Lord wants to minister to each and every one of us. And he wants us to get involved with him. And his spirit wants to move. And not just move, but he, God wants to do something in this place. Praise the Lord. I, couldn't, I, could, I just couldn't get away from the, this morning. And as I was thinking about today, I just, I, I, I just said that, you know, the Spirit of the Lord moved. And if you remember in Genesis, it said that the Spirit of the Lord was basically moving on the waters. But nothing happened until God spoke. We are created in His image. And He has given us some ability to speak things. All over in Scripture, we see that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive. We call on the name of the Lord over us in baptism, right? You speak it out. You, we, we make a confession. We, we speak. There are things that happen when we speak. There's an importance in us using our words and saying it out loud, not just internally, but saying it out loud. And as I was thinking about that, I just, I just feel like the Lord wants to, wants to meet someone here today. And, and right now, usually we, we're all hyped and jumping, but right here where we're at, if God is so simple that if you will just speak some things, I want to, if you have a need, I want you to let it know with a lifting of your hand, if you have a need. Now, when we begin to pray, I want you to speak whatever it is you need. And over and over and over in the scripture, Jesus would listen to how people, he would literally have a blind person come up to him and he would say, what do you need? What? Jesus, obviously. But he said, whatever that man said, sometimes he said, according to your faith. Amen. Or if someone asked him to come pray for someone, if they said, Lord, I believe that if you will come and pray for them, they'll be healed. What did he do? He went and did, but the uh, some other person would come and say, Lord, speak the word only, and I know it will be done. He would meet them at their faith or what they spoke. So I'm wondering right now, if you have a need, I want you, let's lift up our hands and let's just get focused on the Lord right now. I want you to ask whatever you have need of. I want you to ask, all right? And then when you ask, I want you to be specific. And Lord, if you see a picture of someone laying a hand on someone and being healed, I want you to say that. I want you to speak that out. If if you have a sick loved one and you need some and you believe what in the New Testament that people prayed for a napkin and sent it to them and they were healed. If you believe something like that, I want you to speak that out right now. If you believe that if just someone would speak the word of faith over whatever that situation is right now, I want, I want you to speak it out. I want you to say it. I want you to be specific so that, when, that way when God answers it, you know it wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't happenstance. Come on, somebody. There you go. You can feel, you can feel the Lord working. The Lord's beating someone right now. The Lord's hearing our prayers right now. He likes it when we're specific because then he gets the credit. He gets the glory. Lord, right now, if someone asked, if someone believed that if only the word of faith would be spoken, Lord, I pray right now by the authority of the word of God in the name of Jesus, Lord, that the sickness that has riddled someone's body that would be bound and cast out, I pray right now by the authority of the word of God. Come on, somebody. Begin to 
begin to lift up the name of the Lord. The Lord's trying to do something to the person that's riddled with fear and anxiety, Lord. Remove that, get it out, and lose peace and healing into their mind and their spirit. If someone's battling depression, I pray right now that the authority of the Word of God would bind it and cast it out and loose healing and wellness into their mind and into their spirit. The Lord has promised you peace and peace that passes all understanding. We don't get to try that out till we've been in a situation where there is literally no way that you could have peace and the Lord can meet you right in that moment. Praise the name of the Lord. Why don't we lift up our hands? Why don't we clap unto the Lord? Why don't you just talk to the Lord right now? Why don't you just talk to the Lord? Lord, you are good. You are righteous. You are mighty. I thank you, Lord, for whatever you just did in that moment. And I'm ready to see a miracle. I'm ready to see something change. Now, before we move on, there is our part of the miracle. Our part of the miracle. If you said that you needed someone to pray for you, if, you, if that was your faith, I need someone to pray for me for this to happen, then that means that you have to go find someone to pray, have pray for you, okay? We can't believe that if you, if you said out loud earlier, you know, I believe, Lord, if the, if the ministry or just whoever would pray for a napkin, I can take it to a sick friend or family member, and they would be healed. That means that now you have to go get the napkin and get someone to pray for it. It's pretty simple, right? It's pretty simple. That's putting steps in your faith. That's You can't say that God didn't answer your prayer if we don't do our part of the miracle and go or our part of the miracle and believe or our part of the miracle and have someone pray for us. If you are riddled with anxiety and fear and you feel that nudge to have someone pray for you and you don't go and have someone pray for you, nothing's going to happen, right? But you got to take a step and go and let someone pray for you if you someone you believe someone you have trust in someone you have you know faith in in their prayers and so i i I just want to be clear on that if you prayed something specific then now you have a responsibility to upkeep and uphold your part and then god will honor that faith and he will answer he will answer I feel like if someone will get that, you will see something that you have never seen before. You will see an answer to something that you've been waiting maybe a long time. I'm just telling you, we got to put steps on our faith. And if you believe what you were praying for just now, then you got to at some point, you got to step out and do your part of the miracle. Praise the Lord. If you just give the Lord a hand clap. He is good. He is good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We welcome all of our guests. Thank you for being here with us. We're going to continue our worship and giving. You can stay standing because we want you to be ready for this next song. So we can, we give, How we have two ways to give. Wow, can't speak. You can give on site. We have our giving kiosks the giving box in the back. We have the children's church for the little kids. And then you can give online at the the number on the screen and wayoflife.church. I don't know about any of you, but I'm ready to worship the Lord. Why don't we begin to lift up the name of the Lord? Why don't we begin to clap, give the Lord a joyful praise, a joyful noise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. He's here right now. There's lives being touched. Just reach out to him. He wants to do something in your life. God's not done. He started moving right away. And there are lives that are feeling that power. And we want to lift up our hands and let him do what he wants to do in us. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Don't let our praise be empty space. Come about. Wow. 
mountains crumble when you draw near to us you draw near to us strong pulse breaking destinies changing when you draw
all across this place 
There's something powerful going on right now. If you need healing, if you need the infilling of the Holy Ghost, if you have repented of your sins, you can lift your hands right now and open your mouth in praise. And it won't be long until you feel the Spirit begin to move on you. And you will begin to speak in another language that the Spirit has given you the ability. If you're in this house and you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, you can be baptized for the remission, the removal of your sins before you leave this house today. In Jesus' name. Oh, let's just lift up the name of Jesus right now. Oh, hallelujah. When you fill the room, hallelujah. of the Most High, and in His presence, anything is possible. Hallelujah, hallelujah, anything is possible. Praise God, praise God. Let's all clap our hands. Give Him the ovation that He is worthy of. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. What a beautiful presence of the Lord. I'm so thankful. Thank God for this wonderful praise team. Appreciate them. So good to have Sister Joy Norris with us from Atlanta, Georgia. She's been working with Magnify this week, and so she's here to help us today, tonight. What a blessing it is to have her in town, and uh, she is known all over the United Pentecostal Church and the world. Amen, and we appreciate her. And uh, Brother Jordan, you're doing a great job today. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's first Sunday. And if you haven't noticed, there's a few things different out in the foyer. We have T-shirts, and those T-shirts are free for everyone. Make sure you get one. If for some reason we run out of your size, if you'll just tell Sister Beatrice, we'll put it on a list, and we will get some more ordered as quickly as possible. At the end of the month, we are having February Friends Day. The last Sunday of the month, on the 25th, we will be wearing our uh, T-shirts, and uh, so make sure you you get you one in your size, and if for some reason we run out, let us know, and we'll get one before then, and uh, we're so thankful. Also, a uh, beautiful backdrop out there, our ladies did, and we want you to make sure to take some pictures today, and really all month. We're going to leave it up all month. This is our Love Never Fails is our theme for February, and I think that's a great message to give our world, right? If they ever really need it, the real meaning of love. Amen. The real meaning of love. They need it today. 
because the Bible says God is love. Amen. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord today. Brother Phillips taught in the first hour just so powerfully. Shema Have. Shema Have. Amen. The Lord our God is one Lord. And he's the one that we should love, the only one with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. What a powerful message. And uh, it's so good to be here on First Sunday. Uh, tonight is also a service. It's a special service. It's our annual ministry connect. And so all of our other churches are going to be joining with us. There will be eight churches, including us, eight churches represented here tonight with their pastors and congregations. And so immediately after service, I do need the help of all of our men. Uh, if Brother Marco would head this up for me, we're going to uh, get all of the gray chairs out of the building and bring them over here, set up as many as we can in here around the walls, and then we'll stack some out in the foyer just in case we need to fill in some more when everybody gets here tonight. But it's going to be a fantastic celebration, and uh, you don't want to miss it. We're going to have special singing, special guest leading. And it's just going to be a wonderful time, a wonderful celebration. And then afterwards, we're going to do something very Pentecostal. We're going to go eat together. And we're all going to join together at Rosa's on uh, Precinct Line. And uh, they are warned that we're coming. And so they've got a lot of seating. They're usually really fast about taking care of us. And so we're going to have a good time in that, in Jesus' name. Remember this week, we have Tuesday prayer. This is first Tuesday, so it's a special one. So we're having all of our different classes. Our Stephen Project is starting something very, very awesome this week. Brother Matt is going to be teaching, going to be presenting and teaching about how to teach a Bible study, a brand new Bible study that we have purchased. And so if you haven't been a part of Stephen Project yet, and you want to be a soul winner, and you want to know how to teach a Bible study, you need to be here at 7 o'clock for prayer, 7.30 for class. So we'll start here in the sanctuary, and then the class will be in the fellowship center, and then all the other kids' classes and the sin project and all that will be going on as well. It's going to be a great night. And then uh, on Tuesday, or Wednesday night is first Wednesday, and our Ascend students are taking over, and we've got four men, two of them preaching, two of them leading from our youth group, and so it's going to be a great, great night. We're so thankful to have Brother Sister Stewart with us. Amen. He is the North American Missions Promotions Director in St. Louis. He is a longtime friend of this church. He's preached for us many times, and I always kid his brother Tess that he's the better looking brother and the better preaching brother. So do, do we get that on tape? Let's make, let's make well, I'm showing my age. I said tape. Look at there. Did we? <laughs> Did y'all pull out the reel to reel back there? The VCR. Come on, Brother Stewart. We love you so very, very much. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today in this house. We thank the Lord today. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. My wife and I are honored to be here with you at Way of Life, your pastor and first lady, your pastor's wife, two of our favorite people that we know in the world. We appreciate them so much. And my first one, I coming, of course, didn't know knowing about the temporary location. Is it, I know we know the church is not the building. The church is the people. But in a way, it is in life sometimes. We give the Lord a hand clap of praise. But the last time we were here at your Hearst location, your lobby was almost done, remodel was almost complete, and I saw the pictures, how beautiful it looked, and then we all know what happened. That's how life is sometimes. But look how the kingdom grows. We come to this place, it's called a temporary location, but I told your pastor and, and sister Shinnaw, it looks better than most people's permanent location. But somehow I'm not surprised that when your pastor and pastor, everything they do is going to be first class. Even the chairs match, so that's good, amen. But just like the church building had to bounce back, you got to bounce back sometimes in life. I'm sure the enemy thought that when the building was destroyed, the church was destroyed, but way of life was not that building. Amen. We are the church, that we are more than conquerors. 
no matter what goes on. I was surprised this morning to walk in and see Brother Phillips up here teaching because the pastor was, I think, planning on doing it himself. And Brother Phillips surprised them, knowing that's one of the pastor's best friend. I thought I was fired from speaking today. So even though Brother Phillips is here, I appreciate the chance to speak to you. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 1 Samuel chapter 17 is our two key verses we can stand. Indeed, I'm honored to have my wife here with me today. Amen. In the Shindals, when I said there were people we look up to and consider friends, you have to believe me because my wife and I were in Los Angeles Monday to Wednesday for some NAM business, and we were in Connecticut last night for a NAM district rally, and normally my wife would be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go home for a couple of days and catch my breath. So the fact that she's here is a testament that she wanted to be here, and I appreciate her traveling with me. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse number 19. And it says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them sword or spears. But all the Philistines went down, all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, his culture, and his act, and his mattocks. Yet they had a file for the mattocks, and for the cultures, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in a day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son, was there found. First Samuel chapter 17, the words of Goliath speaking, verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and our Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Drop down to verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he delivered me out of the hand of this Philistines. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him, and he took his staff in his hand and chose them five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and a sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Last verse, verse 52. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they had come to the valley of the gates of Ekron, and the wound of the Philistines fell down by the way of Sharon, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And for a few moments today, I've come to ask you a simple question. What happened to the Smiths? Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Lord, quicken your word to our heart. Let us receive from you, Father, be changed, be more like you, molded and shaped it in your image. Let us receive, we pray in Jesus' name. May be seated, amen. As we give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> the name Smith is the most common last name in all of America. Over two and a half million people have the last name of Smith. I could dare project and presume that probably in this crowd today, someone here has the last name of Smith. As a matter of fact, someone's name is John Smith or Mary Smith. We think it's a fake name. It seems like such a common name. And I began to research. I was surprised to find out no U.S. presidents have ever been to Smith. You would think the Smiths would have got that together by now and, and got somebody elected. <laughs> but, you know, I think in every major event of history, Someone named Smith was probably there in the American Revolution, the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Cold War, the space race. Smith may be somebody that may not be in the forefront, may not be well known, they may not be president, they may not be leading, but they're the backbone of our country and what made us what we are. But I didn't come to speak to you about a person by the name of Smith. As most of you realize, most of our names came from something our family probably used to do. If your last name is Farmer, if you trace your family tree far enough, you have some farmer somewhere, amen. Whatever your last name is, Baker, you probably had a Baker somewhere in your family tree. But Smiths, more than likely, have blacksmithing in their past. And, you know, we read in Scripture that this time when the enemy came to attack, they did something very different. There are other times. 
The enemy came and they killed the king took him captive. They, they came and they tried to kill every young man of war fighting age or take them captive back to their native land. Uh, they looked for various ways that they could weaken and conquer the people of God. Amen. But this time, they left them in the promised land. This time, they didn't try to take the king. This time, they didn't round up every young man of fighting age and take them back to Babylon somewhere. This time, they came with a very simple strategy. They would go town to town, village to village, and find every blacksmith. And one by one, take every blacksmith captive out of Israel until not one blacksmith was left. What was the purpose of that strategy? Because the blacksmiths were the ones uh, that knew how to make the swords. Uh, the blacksmiths were the ones uh, that knew how to make the spears. Uh, the blacksmiths were the ones that knew how to take a dull sword or a broken spear and repair it uh, and give it back to a fighting man. Uh, and they knew if we can get rid of the blacksmiths, uh, if we can get rid of every one of them, soon there'll be no more weapons in the entire land of Israel. I wondered, how did the Israelites let this happen as they went town to town and village to village, removing all the blacksmiths? Did no one not see the strategy the enemy had put in place this time? Uh, I wondered, how did they even identify who the blacksmiths were? Uh, I propose to you today that every blacksmith had a fire burning in his house. Uh, there was smoke coming from the chimney. They had a fire that was ready, amen, to make weapons of war. Uh, they had calluses on their hand, amen, from swinging hammer day after day, night after night, forging swords and spears. Uh, I believe the enemy saw that fire burning. Uh, he saw those calluses on their hands and knew that this must be a smith. Uh, and I propose to you today, uh, there have been people in the house of God uh, for generations. Uh, that kept the fire burning, uh, that kept the fire burning, calluses on their knees uh, from countless hours spent in prayer. Uh, when the pastor called prayer meeting, he didn't have to wonder if the smiths were going to show up. Uh, on a Sunday morning service, the pastor had to worry about if the smiths were going to show up. If it was time to prayer and fast, the smiths uh, would be the first ones there. They knew the weapons of all warfare are not carnal but mighty through God yeah. Yeah. and they knew how to pray yeah. and not just pray teach others how to pray how to set an example for prayer yeah. why the strategy of the enemy was so effective because blacksmithing was a trade uh, that was passed down from father to son and father to son uh, for many generations. Uh, and the enemy knew if we are successful in taking out one generation of blacksmiths, uh, Israel will be crippled uh, for many generations to come uh, because the next generation will arise and don't have any idea of how to forge or make a weapon and be effective to fight the enemy. Uh, and that's why in our churches today, the enemy fights us to pray and to fast and to seek the face of God. He doesn't want no one there making an example for the next generation of what it takes. To reach the throne of God. So the Israel was living in a land promised to them. Houses they did not build. Wells they did not dig. And the enemy did not try to take them out of the promised land. But he left them there with no weapons to fight back. I propose to you today. The enemy would love to keep you from coming to church. Uh, some of you today had to push through the very forces of hell just to be here today. Uh, but I've come to tell you today, the enemy doesn't care if you come to church. Uh, if he can keep you prayerless. Uh, if he can keep you powerless. Uh, if he can keep you away from the word of God. He'll let you walk in the promised land. He'll let you come to church. Uh, but he knows that faith 
faith cometh by hearing of the word of God. He knows power. This kind of power goeth not out but by prayer and by fasting. And he can keep you out the word. He can keep you from prayer and fasting. He can keep you away from the power of God. That's his goal. In 2024, I believe that sometime the devil finds it easier to keep us busy than to make us sin. Oh, his goal is to make us sin. Don't get me wrong. Because he knows if he can make you sin, amen, that whoever commits sin becomes a servant of sin. He wants to tempt you and try you and push you into sin. But if he just keep you busy, running to and fro, no time for the things of God, no time to pray, barely can make it a church, whatever it takes to keep you away from all that God has for you. Enemy doesn't care if you're in the promised land, if you're ineffective. Uh, He will take the joy out of your marriage. Uh, He will take the joy out of your walk with God. Amen. Your prayer life and devotional life will suffer because the enemy doesn't want you to have any power. My wife and I are blessed to have three wonderful daughters and Young parents have asked us sometimes, they said, how do you raise children in such an ungodly world? I'll tell you something. You've got to take spiritual authority in your home. You've got to let it be known. My house belongs to God. My kids belong to God. And devil, uh, you don't belong here. See, our our girls were not perfect, just like anybody's kids are not perfect. And on more than one occasion, they got connected to a friend uh, that was detrimental to their walk with God. Uh, We would sit down and talk with them, and we would say, honey, that friend you have, uh, they're not good for you. They're doing things that don't please God. Uh, They really shouldn't be in your life. Uh, And sometimes uh, kids are being like kids. Uh, They would not disconnect from that friend. Uh, But one day, my wife, she would come home, and she would tell me, I am going to pray and fast until God takes that person out of my daughter's life. Uh, And I'm going to tell you something. On many occasions, uh, not many days later, our daughter will come home so sad, say, what's wrong? My new friend just got some news that her dad got transferred. She got to go live with her grandma. She's not going to be here any longer. Amen. Uh, Matter of fact, it got so bad, I asked my wife, uh, I said, I don't mind you praying these kids out of our kid's life, but can you pray them somewhere? fun? Can you pray them somewhere warm? Amen. But they would always want us some podunk place you never heard of. And my wife said, I don't care where they go. I don't care what they do. All I come to tell you is they are not going to be in the life of my child. I come to tell somebody you have power. You have authority. You are called by God to be a smith. You are called by God to be more than conquerors. And too many of us are living beneath our privilege. We're so distracted in the world we live in today. The enemy's job, we are bombarded. I mean, we got so many apps on our phone, I can't even fit on one screen or two screens. You know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, cable news, bombarded all day long. And the the enemy's job is to keep us distracted and focus on the wrong thing. If we were as worried about the devil taking away our spiritual weapons as we are about the government taking away our guns, we'd have all the spiritual power we need. We get so distracted by the things of this world and what the enemy has us focused on. I've come to tell somebody today, I don't care who's in the White House or the governor's mansion or the mayor's office. They don't have the answer that America needs. The answer that America needs is found in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and will heal their land. What America needs today is a people who are called by the name of Jesus to humble themselves and pray, turn off those news, turn off those social media feeds and seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways and God promised I will show up. Forgive them and heal their land. That's what our world needs. That's the answer 
that our world needs today. Now, I, I thank God that UPCI has grown to a place in North America. We have almost 5,000 churches and 11,000 ministers across the fellowship. But an enemy does not fear our numbers. He only feels power and our authority. Look at Judges 5 and 8. What did Deborah say in Judges 5 and 8 about the people of Israel? They chose new gods. There was war in the gate. But she asked a question. Was there a shield or spear found among 40,000? An army that was 40,000 men strong, but not one shield and not one spear. What a sad state to be. We were just in St. Louis recently with a North American Youth Congress. 33,000 young people there. And this year, North American Missions, we had a booth that was called Win Your World. And every young person that walked through that booth, we asked one question. Have you ever won a soul? Have you ever taught a Bible study? And I'm glad to report to you that many came through that booth and said, yes, uh, I started a P7 club in my high school, and my friends are getting saved. I started seeing my chapter, amen, in my high school, and my friends are getting saved. But so many more came through that booth and said, I've never won a soul, and I've never taught a Bible study. But it hit me. We had 12-year-olds. 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds coming through that booth. And we were asking them that question, what about the 50-year-olds in here today? What about the 60-year-olds in here today? How could we expect a teenager to teach a Bible study or win a soul if it's not being exampled uh, by their parents uh, and by the elders in their church? Uh, it's not enough to ask a teenager Will you win your world? I've come to ask some adults, uh, when's the last time you taught a Bible study? When's the last time you brought somebody to church? Uh, when's the last time you've seen a friend or a loved one get full of the power of God? Yeah. Pastor Shinda, I'm about tired of calling our attendance with our Sunday morning church. I'm ready to look for prayer meeting. Uh, how many show up for prayer meeting? Uh, how many show up for Bible study? How many want to have a sword? and a spear and take spiritual authority in their life. See, what you got to understand is that the enemy will always go after what you think you need for battle. Israelites thought that we're going to fight the Philistines. We need swords and we need spears. And so because they thought they needed sword and spears, the enemy said, well, I'm going to come and take your sword and your spears. But guess what? If you think you need money to live for God, serve God, he's going to attack your finances. If you think it's your talents and your abilities that only God can use, uh, he's going to attack your confidence. Whatever you think you need for the battle, it's what the enemy will always attack. Uh, I've come to tell somebody today, all you need is found in Jesus. Uh, all the power you need, uh, all the hope you need, all the confidence you need, all the wisdom you need, uh, all the finance you need, Jesus has it all. Don't let the enemy make you feel inadequate and unprepared. It's all in Jesus. Uh, he can't attack Jesus. You put your faith and trust in Jesus, let him attack what he wants, let him take what he wants. You see, and Israel thought they needed sword and spears. He took their smith, and no one even saw that happening. He said, How could this happen? I believe, I'll tell you how I believe it happened. The Philistines came to attack. They saw them amassing on their borders. And the Israelite says, Guess what? There's going to be a massive loss of life. Our economy is going to suffer. This war is going to cost so much. The stock market is going to go down. My profit sharing is going to disappear. Companies go out of business because in war there's devastation to the economy. But guess time Israel, Philistine showed up and they marched in the land. No fighting. No fanfare. No bloodshed. Economy wasn't affected. 
Stock market was still good. They just went town to town and took out the Smiths. Israel said, wow, this ain't so bad. I thought I was going to have to fight. I thought I was going to have to risk my life. I thought I might die. I thought my finances might be affected. But it was a time of peace and a time of prosperity. They were better off financially and focused on themselves. And no one even noticed that the Smith were disappearing one by one by one by one. That's why the Bible says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, the enemy. It's not taking it easy. He's attacking you somewhere. He's fighting you somewhere. Don't think you can peacefully coexist Amen. with the enemy. Amen. You know, John Davis here, I grew up in Liberia, West Africa. I was born in Ethiopia. A big mistake we make in America over and over again, you, you can negotiate with terrorists. You can't negotiate with terrorists. They know one thing, and that they know force. I never will forget when Reagan bombed Libya. Everybody was like, oh, no, oh, no, we bombed Libya. That was the best thing we ever did because why? All the enemy knows is force. Amen. You will never really peacefully coexist with the devil, so don't think you can. Don't think you're better off not fighting. Don't think you're better off. Amen. Not going through something. We're at war. It's going to cost you something. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be messy. It's going to be expensive. But guess what? It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it because the next generation will see us fighting and they'll know what to do when the enemy comes for them. So after he got rid of all the blacksmiths, the Bible said all they were left with were shares and, and cultures and an axe and a maddox. All the enemy left them with was farming tools. Took all the swords, took all the spears. He left them with plowshares and hoes and a a pickaxe. You know why he did that? Because he wanted to be able to go ahead and make a living, feed them and take care of them and and work in their economy. Then they told the Israelites, I know we took all your blacksmiths, but bring your stuff to us and we'll sharpen it any time you want to. The Bible says they took their things to the Philistines so the Philistines could sharpen their tools. Uh, I've come to tell you we don't need the world to approve of our methods. Uh, We don't need the world to sharpen our tools. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the beautiful job that you've done in the sanctuary, the hard work you did, the nice projector in life, but we don't need that to have church. Uh, I thank God for technology. I don't care what the mega church across town has that we don't have. Uh, I don't care how big their building is. I don't care what talent they have. I've come to tell somebody the weapons of my warfare are mighty through God. I don't need the world to sharpen my weapons, approve my weapons, tell me what I need to have. I come to tell somebody that all I have is found in him. Now, please don't take, I'm about to say next wrong. I thank God that we have apostolic lawyers and doctors and nurses and teachers, and we need more professionals out there making a living and supporting the kingdom of God. I went to Bible college and unaccredited Christian life college for four years. And my kids say I went to church camp for four years. They don't respect my education. (laughs) But while in Bible school, I didn't even meet my wife and had no kids. I told myself way back then, I said, when I have kids, they're not coming to Bible school. When I have kids, they're going to get a real job, a real career, a real job. I, I said, they're not, coming, they're not doing what I did, struggling financially like I did. And now God bless us with three wonderful daughters. None of them asked to go to Bible school. All of them have beautiful talents they use for the kingdom. And I thank God for what they do with their skill set and degrees they have. So I'm not criticizing that at all. But what I'm ashamed to tell you today, if 30 years ago, one of my daughters came to me and said, Dad, I... I feel a call to the Bible college. Uh, Dad, I, I think I'm being called to the mission field. Now, here it is. I grew up in Liberia, saw God's deliverance in the middle of the war, and have time to tell you about bullets fired at my dad, hand grenades, drinking from a water bed my family had to do for seven days. Seeing the provision of God. But I'll be out 30 years ago, and one of my girls had come to me and said, Dad, I feel a call to ministry, and I, I just want to go to Bible school, and I, I just want to go overseas to the mission field. I would have done my best to talk them out of it. I'm just being honest with you. But look at my wife and I life today with my unaccredited Bible school degree. God has blessed my wife financially more than we deserve. 
God has blessed my wife and I so if I had gone to the best Ivy League University and got the biggest job you could think of, uh, I don't think that my wife and I could have had the opportunities in life and things that God has opened to us. Uh, so I'm embarrassed to think about there was a time in my life uh, where I would have tried to tell my children, you don't know, no, uh, don't do that, don't go there, don't give your life to God to that extent. Because uh, I'm here to tell you today, the Bible says, see Seek ye first uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. I'm not saying everybody needs to go in ministry and Bible school. I'm just saying if that's what God wants you to do, you got to be willing to say, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I'll live. And you could be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. Let God use you in that profession. Uh, but if God has called you to something else, don't be afraid to answer that call of God because God will always keep you wherever he takes you. We read in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 16, Goliath came out every day for 40 days and mocked the entire army of Israel and said, give me a man that we may fight. You know, I've always criticized the army of Israel on that mountainside that not one person stepped down to fight the giant. When I read the scripture, they said, wait a minute. The Bible says that over time, the only weapons in the entire nation of Israel was Jonathan had a sword and Saul had a sword. Just the king and his son. That's all that had weapons. It's part of the problem in our church today. We think only the pastor should know how to pray. The pastor should be the only one that door knock and witness and outreach. We got a pastor to do all that stuff. That's not God's plan. Everybody has a weapon. Everybody has a call. Everybody has a ministry. But guess what that means? That means when Goliath came out for 40 days to give me a man to fight me, they stood up there on that mountainside. All they had was a rake, a hoe. They didn't have, they didn't have, they had farm tools, all they had. I'm surprised they showed up for 40 days. I'll be honest with you. If I didn't have a weapon, I'd be like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go out there and be embarrassed again today. Just the fact they showed up meant something to me. And some of you, just the fact you're here. After all you've been through, after all you felt today, and you just still showed up, I thank God that you're here. Hallelujah. But he defied them for 40 days. And he said, give me a man that we may fight. And the Bible says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I don't blame them. If all I had was a rake and an axe, I'd probably be scared too. Goliath's over nine and a half feet tall. Amen. He had a, his coat of mail, weighed over 150 pounds. Just the tip of his spear weighed over 15 pounds. So they stood there that day. Amen. Uh, and they were dismayed. Uh, they were greatly afraid uh, because they looked at this big giant. They looked at their little farm tools. And they looked at the job in front of them, and they were scared to move forward. I've come to tell somebody today, you've been looking at what you have, looking at yourself, uh, looking at what you have, and looking at the battle the enemy is putting before you, and you say, what am I going to do? I've come to tell somebody that the book of Mark lets me know these signs shall follow them that believe. It's not just for the pastor in my name. Shall they cast out devils? Uh, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's the power you have as a believer. That's the power you have as a child of God to cast out devils, drink deadly things, speak in new tongues. That's what God wants you to have. So David shows up as we read. And David said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, guys. Let me ask you what's going on here. Y'all don't got no weapons, and y'all don't know what to do. But let me tell you a story. I was watching my sheep one day, and a lion showed up to kill one of my sheep. Now, I'll be quite frank with you. If David had a sword or David had it, he'd been happy to use it to kill that lion. Uh, but David said, all I had was my two hands. Uh, and I took my two hands because that was all I had. I went to fighting uh, and I killed the lion. Uh, and then another day, a bear showed up. And I said, here we go again. Uh, I don't have a knife. Uh, I don't have a sword. I don't have a spear. All I have is my bare hands in God. But that's all I have. I'm still going to go to fighting. I come to tell somebody 
today. If you down to a spot, you don't have no friends, you don't have no family, you don't have no money. All you got is your two bare hands and Jesus. That's all you need. Let the lion roar. Let the bears come. And all I got is my two bare hands and Jesus. Well, guess what? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If all I got to go to fighting is my two bare hands. I'm going to go to fight. Then Saul said, go and God be with you. But Saul said, before you go, David, here's my sword. Here's my armor. Here's my helmet. Here's my coat of mail. I used to criticize Saul for saying, how you give this little teenage boy your weapons and you didn't go? But actually, I thought about, wait a minute, Saul, you only had one sword. There's only You took half of the entire arsenal of your country. The only weapons were you and your son. That was quite a vote of common. Saul said, all I got is one sword. And one, but here, you take all I have to go to fight. And let's be honest here. You know, we talk about David's faith a lot, but he tried that stuff on. I mean, David wasn't stupid. David looked at it and said, wait, you know, it would be nice to have a helmet. It would be nice to have a little bit of armor on. It would be nice to have, I've never even seen a sword before. But that's what they say you need to go to war. It would be nice to have the stuff that the world says I need to go to war. But there was just one problem. He put on that helmet, uh, and he picked up that sword, and he put on that armor. He says, wait a minute. I have not proved them. Uh, I know this is what the world says. I need to go to battle. Uh, any book of war studies you want to read would highly recommend it. If you're going to face a giant, he has a sword and a spear. He has an armor and helmet. You have the same thing to fight him with. Uh, so it makes sense, humanly speaking, for David to say, Saul, thank you very much. Uh, you must really trust me. You have one sword, one spear, one coat of armor, and you're giving me everything you got. Uh, but David said, it sure would be nice uh, to fight the devil with this. Uh, but guess what? I have not proved it. I've come to tell somebody, stop looking for new weapons. Uh, stop looking for new methods. What it took to get you here today is all you need to do what God wants you to do tomorrow. What got you here was your faith and obedience to the word of God. What made your marriage last this long? Uh, what kept your kids alive this long? Uh, what kept you in a sound mind so far? Uh, what still has your preaching? It was your faith uh, and your obedience to the word of God. So why do you think uh, you need something else now? What you have proven to make it this far is all you need to go the rest of the way. You don't need new weapons, new methods, new things. The fact you're here today is just a miracle. You know, the devil knows he's, in, he's already taking his best shot against you. The devil's thrown every rock he could throw, every temptation, every trial. The fact that you are still here makes you a more than a conqueror. So what got you here is all you need to make it the rest of the way. So David said, I'm sorry, Mr. King. I appreciate you offering me the best that you have, the best that the world can give. But I have not proved them. What I have proved is my God. And the Bible says that he, he had a shepherd's staff. All he came with was a shepherd's staff. And it said he had a script and a sling. And it said all he had was a bag and a shepherd's staff and a sling. But guess what? All you need is what you have. Amen. Look what happened at the gate. Beautiful. That man was there begging, and Peter and John came by. He said, excuse me, sir, can you give me some money? And what did they say? Sorry, we don't have no money. And he was like, another broke Christian. <laughs> All these Christians going to church, you know, so ain't got no money. But they said, guess what? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to thee in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Uh, that man was asking for what he wanted. Uh, amen. And Peter and John didn't have what he wanted. They had what he needed. Uh, and sometimes you don't have what the world wants, uh, but you have what the world needs. Because uh, what the world needs is someone to say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, uh, rise uh, up and walk. And sometimes I worry our young people 
are going to war with worldly weapons because we haven't taught them how to use apostolic weapons. I am not condoning church planners that leave the truth and go start a church across town and try to build a mega church the world's way. But sometimes I wonder, did we even show them what it means to have apostolic weapon? Do they know what it's like to go out there when all you got is just a couple of rocks and a sling and God and that's all you need? We don't need the stuff uh, that the world says we need. We have the truth of the gospel. We have the name of Jesus. We know what it takes to get into the kingdom and that's all we need to go to war. But guess what happened? David took his rocks and his sling. And look at 1 Samuel 17 and 42. The Bible says that giant looked at him. He called him a dog. He disdained him. He looked down upon him. He, he, he was upset. But look at the three reasons, 1 Samuel 17 and 42. Look at the three reasons that the Philistine hated David. He was a youth. He was too young. He was ruddy. He was red-faced. If you can put that scripture up for me if you can. 1 Samuel 17, 42. He was a youth. He was red-faced. And he was good-looking. Had a fair countenance. He looked at him and said, you're too young. You never been shaved yet. And you're too good-looking to come fight me. But look at the chapter before in 1 Samuel 16, 11. When Samuel came to anoint the king, he said, Jesse's all your kids. Jesse said, yeah, there's one more back there keeping the sheep. He's not worth anything. He said, go get him. And when David came before Samuel, look at the reason in 1 Samuel 16 and 12, the reason that God anointed him to be king. The Bible says he was ruddy, he was red-faced, of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. The three reasons that the giant hated David are the same reasons he was anointed to be king. The devil will always hate what God loves. That's why he attacks our doctrine. Amen. That's why he attacks separation from the world as not being important. That's why he attacks everything that God loves, the world is going to hate. Every, that's why we can't worry about pleasing the world because what qualifies you to be a child of God is what the world is going to hate. So if you are here today, you need to know that God loves you just like you are. God wants to save you just like you are. It may not look like much to the world that all you are is red-faced, good-looking, and young, but God says that's all. All I need to anoint you to be king. And don't worry about the world's uh, approval. So obviously, in this David versus Goliath battle, Goliath had the upper hand according to the world. And look at 1 Samuel 17 and 44. The Philistine made a direct threat to David. He said, if you come to me, little boy, I'm going to take your flesh. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with your flesh. I am going to give it to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, that, that seemed to be an accurate. The dude was 10 feet tall, you know. He could do that, it seemed like. So the devil is speaking to some of you today, telling you what he's going to do if you keep coming to church, what he's going to do if you keep believing, keep going, how you're not going to make it because you didn't make it last time. He comes to you with threats. See, but I love what David did in the next verse, in verse number 45. Uh, you see, one thing about living for God, you got to face your reality. God don't want you acting like you got no problems. You got to face you, but greater is he that's in you. So David stated the obvious. He said, excuse me, Mr. Giant. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. See, I, I, I don't mind telling you I had a few trials in my life. I, I don't mind telling you I done faced a few giants in my life. I done been through a few things that looked impossible. So David admitted the obvious. So I understand you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. But guess what, Mr. Giant? I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I don't have a sword and I don't have a spear. I didn't take the king's stuff. But guess what? I got the name of the Lord. 
And he didn't stop there. He said, let me say to him, what, wait, wait, Mr. Giant, you told me you're going to take my flesh and give it to the birds and the beasts. But, well, Mr. Giant, I got some words for you in the next verse. This day is God will not only put you yourself into my hand, and I'm going to smite you, and I'm going to cut off your head. I ain't got no sword, but I'm going to cut off your head. And, and you said you're going to give my carcass and my body. Guess what? I'm going to take the carcass of the entire host of the Philistine. He said, Mr. Giant, how dare you tell me that you you're going to feed me to the bird. You Guess what, honey? I'm going to kill you and your mama and your grandmama and everybody. I'm taking your whole army. He said, I'm going to take the entire host of the Philistines, and I'm going to feed them today to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the earth. The whole earth would know there's a God in Israel. Let the devil threaten him. But devil, you don't want none of this, devil. I said, you don't want none of this. You're going to do what to me? Well, guess I'm about to do to you. I'm going to take you and your whole army and feed them. But guess what I love the most? See, in verse number 46, he's looking at giant right in the eye. He said, Mr. Giant, I'm about to smite you. I'm going to cut off your head. And I'm going to feed you to the birds. I'm going to feed you to the fowl. Then I'm going to take this whole army behind you. I'm going to do the same thing. But in verse 47, he turned his back to the giant. Look up to the hill at his brothers and Saul and the whole army of Israel. Standing up there with their pickaxe and their rakes and their hoes, no weapons in their hand. Look what he says in verse 47. This assembly would know the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. That was a word for the church because the Israelites thought, oh, we can't fight because we have no swords. We have no spears. We lost all the blacksmiths. We don't know how to fight anymore. We don't have none of that stuff. But you know what David was saying? Y'all forgot, honey, that time the Red Sea parted and Pharaoh and his army came through and God used water to drown them. Didn't need a sword or a spear. Did you forget about that time that Korah stood up and defied and the earth opened up and swallowed out of them. You forget about the time that Elijah called fire down from heaven and burned up the enemy and all his men. Uh, he was reminding them, wait a minute, understand something here. God don't need the world's stuff. God don't need the world's approval. God don't need your stuff. Remember today, the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. So it don't matter what you don't have. Because God don't need that stuff anyway. And guess what he did next? He put his hand in his bag and took out one rock. The Bible says he had five rocks. Goliath had four brothers. He's going to take them all out. And when he threw that rock right in the forehead of the giant, right in the brain. When you go for the enemy, we go right for the brain. We go right for the command center. And that enemy dropped without a sword and without a spear. And what I, what I think is so amazing, the Bible says that David then had to climb on top of the Philistine. He, that Philistine was so big, David couldn't even stay. He had to climb on, step on him. I come and tell somebody today, some giants in your life, when you stand up in the name of Jesus, what look like it's about to destroy you and your feet, you're going to stand on it. You're going to stand on and give God something. You're going to be walking on top of what seemed was going to destroy you. And that insult to injury, he took the giant's own sword to chop his head off. Amen. Now, the Bible says that God has laid up the wealth of the wicked to give to the righteous. You know, right before general conference, we made some phone calls, and we found out that around the country, we had 11 church planters that were given buildings free of charge. Beautiful buildings. You know, for so many years, uh, we were the little church on the wrong side of town, and we had nothing. We had no buildings, and all the other mega churches had all the stuff. But guess what God is doing? These churches are drying up. The denominations are going away. And God is saying, you've been on the wrong side of track long enough. Uh, I'm taking buildings that someone else paid for and handing them to United Pentecostal church planner and say, here's the building, here's the chairs, here's the stuff. He's going to take the sword. Amen. Not our sword because we didn't have one. But guess what? He took the enemy's sword to chop off his head. And God has taken resources that others have had for so long and said, guess what? I'm going to bring it into the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that the Philistines begin to flee. What I love the most uh, is that the Bible says when they saw that happening, the men of Israel and of Judah, we know Judah means praise, uh, they begin to get up and they begin to shout the victory and they pursued the Philistines and they went all the way down to the valley and they destroyed the Philistines. 
you know, Brother Bernard was telling us recently, back in the Brush Arbor days, two older ladies went to a town in West Virginia to start a church. And there were seven bars in that town. They went in front of every bar and prayed and taught Bible studies until every bar became a church. Shut down every bar in that city. That's just the power of God. We're so worried about going into certain parts of town. We're so worried about what we're going to do. These ladies just went there and turned seven bars uh, into churches. But I come to tell you today that back in those days when they wanted to fight the enemy, they had to go look where the enemy is because we live in a country that had a little bit more morality. But I've come to tell you today the enemy is all around you. Uh, the enemy is in your home. Uh, enemy's trying to get in your kids. He's in your cell phone. He's in your laptop. We don't have to look for bars or go wonder where the enemy is. I'm coming to tell you that the church is under attack. Uh, the enemy is coming after your future, your children, your marriage, your life, your ministry, but guess what? You go to war right where you are right now. Some of you are new to the church, and you see people up here on the praise team and preaching. Say, I want to get involved. God didn't save you just for you to be on the platform. God saved you to go out there into this world and find more lost people and bring them into the kingdom of God. Uh, and you say, but preacher, amen, I don't know what to do. Uh, let's look at a few scriptures. Uh, look at Judges chapter 3 and verse 31. Uh, the Israelites, they had no swords uh, and they had no spears, uh, amen. And But they told them, you have an ox gold. That's a cattle prod. They said, if you bring me your ox gold, uh, amen, we will sharpen your ox gold. Uh, and in Judges 3, 31, Shemgar, the son of Anath, uh, he slew up the Philistines, 600 men with a cattle prod. Uh, how do you kill 600 men with a cattle prod? Because he woke up one day, Shamgar said, I don't have a sword. I don't have a spear. All I got is a cattle prod and God. I'm just going to go to war with what I have. There's no more smiths. They've been taken out. But I'm going to take this cattle prod and kill 600 men. Uh, you ever thought about the reason that Samson never used a spear or a sword? They had no spears and they had no swords. And one one day Samson said in Judges 15 and 15, all I got is a jawbone of a donkey. Uh, if all I got is a jawbone of a donkey, went out that day and killed 1,000 armed men. Uh, you said, preacher, what are you telling me? I'm telling you, if all you got uh, is a jawbone of a donkey, if all you got is a cattle prod, and the enemy got the best weapons all around you, and you say, what am I going to do? I just want to remind you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm just asking, what happened to the smiths? What happened to the prayer warriors? What happened to those? That knew how to get in touch with God. The mothers of the church that were so anointed to, to be used of God. And as we stand together today, see, the enemy was smart. He took out the smiths. Eventually, we read nowhere that they went around and got all the weapons. But eventually, they got broken, dull, and effective. Nobody knew how to use them. They, they weren't effective no more. They had no more smiths to fix them. But the Bible says the enemy left them with a file. You know what a file is? A file is something that was made in the fire. But now it's a cold, dead piece of metal that you can use to file, to sharpen your farm tools just enough to get. It's not, gonna, it's not like a black, it's not a sharp new edge. Can, it just sharpens it just enough to get through. And some of you live your life, you're just filing. I just want to make it through Sunday. You got a little file. It's, it's not the fire it used to be. It's not the overcoming power you used to be. You got a little fire. I, I worry sometimes. We come to church sometimes with pre-programmed services. You know, you know, Leonore Raven asked the question, do the Pentecostals look back in shame when they dealt on the wrong side of the tracks, but the glory of God lasted in their midst for hours? I'm not here just to have long church to have church. I'm just saying, if God wants to move, uh, I'm not satisfied with a little file, just a message, just a, just a file a little bit, just to get by, just enough to get through another day. He left them with just a little thing that they could file, and some of you, you've been barely making, and you come in, just get a little file, get a little edge, just get enough just to go another day and go another week. Uh, but I've come to tell somebody that this began in the fire it cannot end in the smoke uh, this began full of the Holy Ghost full of power, full of anointing and full of deliverance every head bow and every eye closed you're here today you may be like me and you can't sing a lick 
may be like me, have rhythm. You can't, no rhythm. You can't play an instrument. You, you may not be able to speak. You may not be called to preach. He said, well, what can I do for God? Just be a smith. We need some smiths to come back. We need some people that will pray, that will fast, that will seek the face of God. Full of the power of God to say, God, I'm, my lost loved ones are going to be saved. My neighbors, my friends, Lord, I, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to have, I'm going to win a soul for God in 2024. God, I, I want to be on fire for you. I don't want to be lukewarm. I, I, Lord, I want to, whatever it takes, I, I want to be a smith. I want the fire to flow. I, I want to have a weapon. Amen. Because the Bible says, amen, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. The weapon you need is the word of God. And you can use the word and have victory and have peace and remember if we humble ourselves and pray God's going to say seek my face and I'll forgive your sins I will heal your land let's get some smiths today come forward right now as they sing they say Lord I want to be a smith uh, you need the Holy Ghost come forward and say Lord fill me with your spirit Lord I want your power I want to train the next generation my of God is more than enough